And one of the things I've been trying out in my talks recently uh, about English learners, so I'm going to try it out with you, and you can tell me what you think of it. So my, my new thing is to say, what if we started teaching all students as though they were English learners, rather than thinking about how to adapt our instruction for English learners? Because if we think about all students benefiting from academic language embedded within text, strong undercurrent of building background knowledge by using multiple genres, most of which are information text-based, and by providing opportunities for engaged discourse around knowledge and learning, would we not be enhancing outcomes for all students? So let's think more about how to design instruction for English learners rather than how to adapt instruction for English learners. So try it out, see what you think. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, several studies. The first studies are with young students building foundation knowledge about word study to word meaning to comprehension. The next studies are with middle school students focusing on some of the things both Russell and Diane and uh, Noni talked about with respect to vocabulary and a background knowledge within content instruction. So let's start with the initial studies. All of our sample lessons can be found at this website. We have videos at this website, etc. I should also preface this by saying that a lot of people work on these projects, not just me. I'm the one doing the talking. Um, I also want to say that I am, was not on the panel for the practice guide, and I am not representing the panel for the practice guide. I am only representing myself and my work. Um, but I think Russell would agree that many of the studies that I'm talking about were used as studies for the practice guide. OK. So, we know that when you think about um, early literacy and oracy, the development of language to literacy, we know that some students are going to struggle no matter what language they're taught in. And I know that you represent a number of states. In some of your states, you teach only students to read and write in English. In some states, like Texas, we teach students to uh, read and write in um, uh, Spanish and English, we have transition programs, etc. So I'm going to talk about um, two sets of studies in which the first set of studies students learn to read in uh, Spanish and the second set of studies they learn to read in English. But let me say something, this is really important. We did not decide the language of instruction. The language of instruction was decided by the school and then we aligned the interventions with the language of instruction used in the schools. So basically, we have uh, students learning to read in Spanish. We call them Spanish participants, but all of these students are bilingual. They're first graders. The English participants are learning to read in English. These are all students with low language, low literacy. When I say cohort one, it means this is study one. These are independent, non-overlapping samples. Cohort two is study two. And you'll see that within each of those, we have treatment and comparison groups, OK? So just to kind of give you an idea of how the intervention proceeds, the primary focus was on reading, but it had a parallel version in Spanish and English. What I mean by that isn't that it was translated, but that the uh, components and the sequence of instruction was similar but that in Spanish, of course, the students learn to read complex uh, words much quicker because there is greater transparency between the phonology and the orthography. And also, it's uh, much more consistent. English is a less consistent language, and so it takes a little longer to ramp up with the word reading. And also, actually, with reading comprehension, because you get to less complex text slower than you do in Spanish. You get to more complex tests faster. 
Um, it was an intervention. Uh, Russell was right. Most interventions are about 30 to 40 minutes a day. This was 50 minutes a day. And the reason it was 50 minutes a day is because we built in a strong oracy component with story retell around content area or academic vocabulary. A group size was about four, and it was in addition to their tier one instruction. So the, sto the lesson cycle looked something like this. There's a story retell. And Shannon, will you raise your hand? Shannon uh, is an expert on this story retell procedure. If you want her to go through it, we have examples of this story retell procedure on our we website. It has built-in reading lessons and then embedded language supports uh, with, uh, throughout the instructional cycle. And so the story retell goes something like this. I'm going to say it really quickly. But basically, it's around information text. The information text is sequenced around a theme. And so it's around different topics around that theme so that they can practice the academic vocabulary in various genres. Because the children are in first grade, it focuses initially on listening. And then as students get more advanced, it focuses on text. The book is read aloud. And then there's a pause in which students have a chance to retell. The academic vocabulary are pre-taught. And so when students hear that academic vocabulary, they do thumbs up. So it's a way to pay attention to whether or not they're catching the vocabulary when it's read. And also, here's something I think is important, which is that the story retells for listening comprehension are harder or easier than students' level of um, grade level. What do you think? More advanced, right? Because you can understand text that's more advanced than you can uh, read or on your grade level. So that's the story retell. This isn't working. We'll do this. Um, basically, the reading instruction is um, as uh, systematic as we could make it. It focuses initially on sounds, moves into complex word reading. It integrates fluency and comprehension practices initially within decodable text and then moving to more complex text types with an emphasis on mastery and then uh, generalization. There are uh, new information is kept to a minimum, so students are integrating the new information within already known information. And then there's a review and generalization opportunity. So just to kind of give you a visual image for those of you that benefit from that, if you look at the instructional design, the line indicates where in the instructional sequence it occurs. So the red line indicates from the beginning to the end of the year. So if you look at vocabulary and concept knowledge, from the beginning we teach that. Phonemic awareness from the beginning. But then phonemic awareness stops and you move into encoding. And we have some recent research that suggests that phonemic awareness is um, about, takes about 15 hours total. So we don't need to be teaching phonemic awareness for you know entire first grade year for 40 hours. Most kids get it pretty quickly. And by the way, phonemic awareness linked to print, not in isolation. That's really the most powerful way to teach it. Letter sound recognition, word recognition picks up a little later. Connected text related to fluency picks up even later in the sequence. But comprehension strategies, you notice they start from the beginning with listening comprehension moving to reading comprehension as students move into more complex texts. And so in English, students are taught differently than in Spanish. In English, they're taught to be flexible decoders because in English, our most common words like the, was, from, of are actually decodably inconsistent, right? So words they get a lot of, the, the automatic uh, decoding skills don't align well with the um, print. Whereas in Spanish, there's very close transparency. So you teach kids the sounds. You look at the letters. They can decode really quickly. It works really nicely. So actually, what we should really do is just teach everyone Spanish, because it's so much easier to learn to read. That would be a really good idea. Um, they need less phonemic awareness in Spanish. They move into multi-syllable words much quicker. They process the words syllables by syllable and can learn to do that pretty quickly. They read much more complex word structures sooner. That's what you should do in Spanish. 
and the Spanish text becomes what we would call richer or more complex earlier because it allows for more advanced comprehension because students can learn to read this transparent language much quicker. Does that make sense? And that's what happened in our studies as well. So I'm going to first start off telling you about the Spanish uh, findings. And these are students that were randomized. Now, most of you know what a randomized controlled trial is. It means that students have an equal opportunity of getting into the treatment condition or the control condition. Okay, It's like flip of a coin. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. And if you're in the treatment condition, those are the students I'm talking about right now, they significantly outperformed the students in the control condition on letter sounds, phonemes, word attack, oral reading fluency, passage comp, and overall language development. Now, this is students that are in the treatment and control condition are taken from the same teacher's classrooms and from the same schools. So if you're in um, your classroom, you're e you have an equal, and there's six of you that need intervention, you have an equal opportunity of getting into the treatment and comparison condition. And the reason that's important is because we don't want there to be teacher effects. We don't want students to do better because they ended up with a better teacher. And that wouldn't happen in a design like this. So just to kind of run through, and I'm literally going to run through those findings because I showed them to you earlier. Treatment condition outperformed the control condition on almost every outcome measure in Spanish. And if you look at the first two bars, that's two independent samples, two of the treatment conditions. If you look at the next two bars, that's the control condition. And if you look at yellow, that's the pretest. You look at green, it's the post-test. And you can see treatment two did even better on sound uh, identification. This is letter naming, treatment group outperforming the control group in Spanish. This is name identification. This is phonemic awareness. This is passage comprehension. These are standard scores. 100 is the mean. 15 is the, sta uh, is the um, standard deviation. What I like about this is look how quickly we can nor have students reaching typical expectations for comprehension in Spanish. So students in that treatment condition for treatment one and two surpassed the standardized norm. And you can see the growth that they get. Even st students in the other control conditions have nice growth, too. Not as nice. But um, you can see that they made very good progress in first grade. And look at this. This is what cracks me up. These are students whose treatment scores at pretest are two standard deviations below the norm. So they really uh, end up making very nice progress. Same thing in word attack. Uh, oral reading fluency, though these oral reading fluency scores are still somewhat below expectations. That's words correct per minute. And you can see it's about 34 in the treatment condition, 33. And that's still about 10 words correct per minute lower than what we would expect. But they're doing great. They're doing great on comprehension. So the question you should ask me is, well, are those really those findings largely a function of the fact that the students got this treatment condition. And maybe it's because the treatment condition was so long, you know, 50 minutes a day, every day. So I compared it to the standard score points gained per hour of intervention with all other studies. And if you look at the English intervention studies with English language learners, you can see that they average between 2, 3 to 4, 7. That's the effect size, OK, the level of impact. So a higher impact is a better score. And if you look at passage comprehension, they range per hour of intervention from 05 to 35. But in the Spanish, in the first cohort, the word attack averaged per hour of intervention 75 and for passage comprehension 47. So you can see they did do quite well. And here's the overall effect sizes for each sample cohort one and cohort two. And most people would agree that right now, it's very difficult um, to interpret effect sizes consistently across studies. But fundamentally, when you look at effect sizes above 0.3, you're pretty happy with them. And especially when you're looking at something complex like passage comprehension, an effect size of 0.55, that would be considered you know, moderate to high. People would be happy with that. OK? So now let's look at English. We're now looking at students who are English learners. 
These are students learning to read in English. The schools decided that. And by the way, this aligns very nicely with what Russell Gersten uh, said and some of the early work of Noni Lasseau, which is that these students' oral language skills in English are actually very low. They're more than two standard deviations below expected norms, yet they are learning to read in English and they do quite well. So the reciprocity between learning literacy in a language, supporting language, the oral language, as well as the oral language supporting the literacy will be evident in these findings. And you see that we have statistically significant differences in English on fluency, identification, word attack. Uh, dictation is just passage dictation. Uh, and passage comprehension. Probably the most important finding, of course, is passage comprehension. For the second cohort, a non-overlapping sample of students, we have significant differences on the following measures. And what you see, this looks very similar to what we saw in Spanish. This is now in English, and this is letter sound identification. These are raw scores. The first two bars are the treatment conditions. The second two bars are the control conditions. You can see they look pretty much the same at pretest, which is what you would want in a randomized control trial. And you can see that you have gains at post-test. And the same thing on phonemic awareness. Look at this treatment one group on phonemic awareness. So what people would ask, what do you think happened between treatment one and treatment two? And what we think happened is that that was at a time when the state of Texas finally started integrating research-based practices into our training. And so the teachers started teaching phonemic awareness, and you can see it in our control, con I mean, in our uh, pretest scores in treatment too. But uh, there's the post-test scores, lots of gains. Uh, English letter uh, name identification. That does reach a ceiling since you know we have a limited number of letters they can name. <laughs> uh, English rapid letter naming. That has more to do with speed of processing. Uh, English word attack. So these are standard scores, and you can see that the uh, treatment condition either reaches or exceeds the expectation of 100, which is nice. Here's passage comprehension in English, and you can see that these students are you know, more than a standard deviation below expected uh, performance in English passage comprehension. And at least the first treatment condition gets very close to 100, and the second one makes gains, but not nearly like the first one. The English oral language composition. Look at this oral language skills, though. Um, these are, uh, it's actually hard to find a sample of students where the mean is this low. These are more than two standard deviations below uh, expectations. So these students are really, truly learning English. And you can see that they do actually make some gains in English language uh, uh, comp their composite score over time, but they still have more work to do. It's a lifetime of work for most of us. This is oral reading fluency, and these are students who cannot read any English words. You can see they're reading, these are raw scores, so they're reading two words, one word, okay, at pretest, and then they improve. But you can see that their oral reading fluency, if you remember, even at the end, is lower than the student's Spanish oral reading fluency by about 10 words correct per minute. So it is lower. Um, and then here's the effect sizes. And you can see in cohort one, the effect sizes on the priority skills of word attack and passage comprehension are quite high for cohort one, much lower for cohort two, which I can actually explain those effects to you um, if you like. The standard score points gained per hour of intervention, this is the English, and that middle line that's highlighted is based on this study. And you can see it's higher than previous studies, comparable studies in English. And you can see how it compares to the effect sizes in Spanish. Okay. So I put this up there. I took a speed reading course and read War and Peace in 20 minutes. It's about Russia. And the, and the reason I put that up there is because we, we seem to be sort of obsessed with this idea of oral reading fluency. And we seem to be obsessed with it across the grades. And I mean, we can always get you know, kids to read faster. 
But what's really important is that they have some kind of deep understanding of what they're reading. So I, I think there's a threshold for oral reading fluency, but it's not something we really want to be obsessed with, OK? Um, let me tell you, the reason I'm going to show you some of the follow-up data is because many people worry that we do these interventions in first grade and that they don't stick. So what we did is we followed the students into second grade and then in, again into fourth grade. And we didn't provide any treatment in between. So they are now have an equal chance to um, return and look much like the comparison group. And what you see, these are the, English, the students who were taught to read in English, the students who were taught to read in Spanish. And this is at the end of second grade, no booster, no treatment, OK? So let's see how much the findings washed out over time. And you can see, I, those are pretty good findings. Don't you agree, Russell? I mean, you'd be happy with those at the end of treatment, much less at the end of second grade. So you get word attack skills in the fours and fives. You get word reading effectiveness in the fours and fives. That's very good. At the end of second grade, passage comprehension is 3-1 in English, almost 5-0 in Spanish. People are, I'm pretty happy with that. So now, let's look at fourth grade. This is three years after the treatment. We haven't done anything to these students. We just go back in and test them. Let's see how they do. And look at oral language comprehension in Spanish is 0.20. We get no difference between treatment and comparison in fourth grade. Letter word identification, still nice, robust effects. Word attack, 0.29 in English, 0.20 in Spanish. Word reading, 0.22, 0.36. Passage comprehension, most important outcome. Still uh, significant differences you know, 0 0.25, 0 0.30, oral reading fluency and spelling. So we're pretty happy that, that this first grade intervention not only had effects at the end of first grade, but the effects lasted through uh, fourth grade on some of the important outcomes. So I had just had to throw this in there. I know my seven-digit phone number, my nine-digit zip code, my four-digit address, and my three-digit area code. There's just one thing I don't know. What's a digit? So. I think we really um, have had a strong theme today about the focus on vocabulary, particularly academic vocabulary. And I want to say this. These are all plus signs. I'm not taking away from that, but I want you to hear this. Academic vocabulary is likely a proxy for content knowledge, what that, background knowledge. So what that means is that students who know a lot about a lot also know a lot of words and what they mean. And that combination, that formula, knowing a lot of vocabulary words and what they mean, plus having a strong background knowledge equals what? What does that equal? It equals comprehension. It equals understanding. So we clearly want kids to know how to read the words. I mean, Noni said that seven times. I counted it. But. It's not sufficient. If they don't have the background knowledge and the content knowledge, if they don't know what the words mean, we're never going to get to the equal sign, which is comprehension. And that doesn't matter whether it's listening comprehension or reading comprehension. So here's the dirty little secret. What happens, and now I'm moving on to my next study, I promise. So what happens is that in as students make the transition to fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, teachers recognize that students can't understand the text because there's too many words they don't know, right? So what's the dirty secret? What happens right around fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade? What happens is we stop asking students to read. What do we do? We read to them. How do I know that? We have just done a study in which we look at content area classrooms, and they spend less than 10 minutes a day with text. Teachers avoid text because it introduces too much complexity. Well, interestingly, I can promise you this. It is very difficult to get good at something you don't do. 
So one of the reasons students have a hard time catching up with word knowledge and background knowledge is because they are underexposed to text. So I don't know why I put this in here. It's mostly because I really do think Dr. Seuss is a genius. And I think his magic with words and um, I, I just think he's amazing. So I threw it in here. So that's why I tell you to keep your eyes wide open, to keep them wide open at least on one side. Um, so vocabulary and comprehension in middle, middle grades is really where the action is, particularly around text and particularly around text that gives you information, knowledge. All right, so this study focused on vocabulary and comprehension. It helped teachers address challenges for instruction and knowledge acquisition, and it examined how to incorporate English as a second language enhancement, such as those powerful tools of not 40-minute videos, OK? Four-minute videos. Four minutes is a long video. Go on to YouTube. How long can you stand it, right? 30 seconds, 60 seconds, right? Aren't I right? And then you're like, come on, let's go, get with it. That's the way your kids are, too. 30-second smart, 60-second, 90-second smart videos that help connect with the background knowledge, help build that, those key vocabulary. That's where the action is. And that's what we did. We did it here in Texas, actually with the support of Lizette. And I tell you, uh, Lizette Reynolds is amazing. For those of you that don't know this, the state of Texas, Wright Russell, is so fortunate. How many? How many chief officers around the country are passionate about English learners, take notes when speakers talk about instruction, and really are committed to making a difference. So we are very fortunate. Thank you, Lizette, and thank you for supporting this. Um, this particular work was done in social studies classes. And um, what we did is we did professional development with the teachers. We taught them to integrate these practices that really benefit all learners. And they were around the English language uh, enhancements that Noni and Russell were talking about earlier. Um, the, they took place for about 12 to 16 weeks. And of course, we did fidelity checks to make sure teachers were implementing it. We focus on a big idea. So what's the big idea of what we're going to learn? We use peer-mediated learning so that we can get that smart, purposeful discourse around a topic or a key question or a key word. And then there's lots of opportunities to enhance vocabulary, strategic use of video, very brief, and graphic organizers with peer pairing to connect it to writing, which we need to do a lot more of. Um, we used the grade. We had a content area reading measure that focused on comprehension and vocabulary. And we conducted observations. So let's look at these student participants. We had uh, ELL and non-ELL students in the treatment and the control condition. And here's the results. If you look at the students who were in the intervention, and you look at their pre and post tests. So let's just look at the pre tests for the non ELLs and the ELLs. And what you see is that, OK, so the non ELLs start off better in vocabulary. That's not that surprising. Um, look at the control condition, pretty similar. Now look at the post test scores for the ELL students in vocabulary 10.57. Nice, nice growth. Look at the post test scores for the control kids in the ELL 7.27. So yeah, statistically significant. We're impressed with that. But here's what I really like about this. Look at the control post-test scores for the non-ELL students. You see those, 10.49? Look at the ELL students. They caught up. So what that tells me is that when EL students are provided opportunities that really give them the benefit of acquiring vocabulary. Not only do they acquire it, but they catch up with respect to this academic vocabulary with the control condition. And by the way, we see the same thing for text comprehension with the non-ELL and the ELL. So if you look at the ELL students, 
They significantly outperform the controls. They start off lower than the non-ELLs. The post-test scores for the ELLs are 3.32. The post-test scores for the control non-ELL are 2.33. So again, the benefits of this kind of systemic, systematic instruction. The idea that ELs need opportunity to learn just continually gets supported by the data we have provide the system, systematic instruction, the benefits are very visible. And it also supports the idea of universal design. So if we start designing instruction for English learners, all students benefit, and you get differential benefit for the English learners, which is exactly what we want. Here's the means and standard deviations, which I showed you earlier, but this is just the same sample. And this is the fixed and random effects models for both the vocabulary and the comprehension, which the only person interested in this is probably Noni and Russell. Okay. Now, this is the same intervention. This time, it's a second study. And this time, we, we are doing a replication. And the reason we like to do replications is because, especially in the kind of work we do in education, we often find that studies don't replicate, not that they do. So you see us doing a lot of replications just to be sure we have a generalized effect. And if you look at vocabulary again, you see that the EL students outperformed the controls. And you can see again, look at the ELLs at post-test, 12.25. The control non-ELs at post-test, 9.86. So again, they actually acquired more academic vocabulary than the uh, non-ELs in the control condition. And the same thing for comprehension. You see that they start off um, at 0 .80. They move to 3.18. And then the controls at post-test are 2.23. So again, that was a replication, and we think, therefore, a generalized finding. So what are some of the things we need to think about with respect to um, beginning reading and then integrating comprehension and vocabulary into instruction for L's? So it, one question we might want to wonder about is in what ways would interventions be beneficially altered for L's with reading difficulties? And actually, I think we've heard the answer to that. We really want to provide structured discourse, purposeful discourse. And by the way, here's an interesting thing. If you do observations in classrooms when teachers say they are doing structured discourse, who do you think is doing most of the talking? Yeah, that is such a hard thing to do something about. And the way we have been more successful at doing something about it is the turn and talk, the partnering. So you start with a lead question, and you say, turn to your partner, use, you have the academic vocabulary words up, choose one or two of those academic vocabulary words and integrate it into your response with your partner, get ready to give an answer, OK, then pull them back and say, OK, what did your team decide? What did your team, do you see what I'm saying? Because if you leave it only in the hands of the teacher doing all of the leadership on the discussion, it's kind of like me today. Who does all the talking? Yeah, OK. So, um, and then how do we enhance language development for L's in ways that promote reading for understanding? And I think we really need to be thinking about that from pre-K through high school. And we need to be thinking about how we integrate that across the curriculum, not how we create oral language time. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. If you want to read more, I have a few, uh, we have a few publications on this topic. You're welcome to them. And I'll take you back to our website, because that's where all the sample lessons are, if you want to take a look at sample lessons. And you can download any of them for free. They're available on our website.